Welcome to the One Life, One Chance podcast. I'm your host, Toby Morse. Um, today, I have a very, very special guest. Um, this guy was probably on, sang on one of the most important records of my entire life. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast, Mr. Dave Smalley. How are you? Welcome to be here. I'm good, brother. <laughs> How are you? Everything going all right? Everything's good, man. Um, yeah, I'm in California. We were just talking before I started recording that you, know, you lived in L.A. briefly, uh, we're, but we're both from uh, Massachusetts. Um, so you were born in Boston? So no, I'm actually not a, a lot of people think I'm from Boston because that's where I kind of, you know, did my first band that people knew about. And, yeah. and I do still kind of identify a lot with, with Bostonians and with my time there. Um, you know, it really was where I came of age as a, from a, you know, from a kind of a boy to a man, so to speak, you yeah. know, but, um, it was, uh, I was actually born in California, um, and then uh, I, I grew up in, like, Virginia, D.C. kind of area, and then I moved to Boston when I was 17, um, and then, you know, that's sort of where, like I say, I kind of transitioned into the the monster, you know, so. <laughs> um, so uh, so where'd you go to school? You went to school, like, all over the East Coast, or did you? So, yeah, I mean, I went to uh, Bishop Ireton High School in Alexandria, Virginia, and then, um, and then Boston College was my was my uh was my college and how how were how were you in school and how how was it growing up for you sorry how was how were you in school in high school and stuff did you enjoy school yeah i love school um i'm one of those dorks you know like there's sort of like this thing with some singers that it like not with you because you're just a badass but (laughs) some of us are like like part really part dork you know and and um and I'm definitely one of those, like, you know, you got your Greg Graffins and your, um, you know, Dexter from the offspring, and, Milo. And, you know, some of the, Milo, right. Right. Yep. And, um, and I'm not quite as, uh, accomplished as those guys. I never got a PhD, but I went and got my master's in political science and, you know, I actually, you know, like the one channel I can't do without is the history channel. And I you know, that, like, man. I'm, I'm one of those guys. Yeah. I wouldn't say yeah, you're a dork. Sure. I would say, I would say, and I had Milo on the podcast too. I would say that, it, you know, you, you guys, I mean, it's cool to be smart too. You can be smart and be a punk rocker. Like you don't have to be sure, from, sure. A, from, well, from a broken home like, in the streets. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. I mean, but smart doesn't always equate with a piece of paper on your wall, you know? True. So, so, I mean, I have, I have a lot of, really great friends who are freaking brilliant and who may or may not have something on their wall in Latin. But I also have, I also know people who have things on their walls that are, that are, you know, maybe not the, you know, brightest bulb on the tree, you know? So yeah, I, yeah. I don't think that the education always equates to intelligence. Um, it's, it's nice to have if you're into it. That's kind of how I view it, you know? Yeah. So, but, uh, so, so you, so you, you enjoyed school. I did, yeah. I, I studied uh, so communications in my in my undergrad, and then uh, political science for my grad days. And um, you know, I, I loved all of it. I really did. And I just, um, you know, still try and view myself as kind of like learning every day. You know, like I try and like I'm reading a biography right now of Edward the Third, which I think most people would probably just say okay yeah no you know <laughs> but i'm like i'm like totally into it it's really dramatic i have no idea that this guy like edward the third his father was pronounced dead but he wasn't dead he was actually being held prisoner in a castle and then there oh, was wow. this whole coup against him and they were trying to hold edward the third in a in a castle and his friends went through an underground passageway into the castle where he was being held and they they captured the captors and they and they freed Edward the Third and he was like a young man, you know, at the time. So he's still trying to figure his way out as being king. And so there's all this drama oh, and stuff. And I know people that really follow that stuff are really into it, but um, I I'm not that you know familiar with all the English history as much. So for me, yeah. it's like super riveting, super cool. That's awesome. So you're an avid reader, so you, you read a lot. I try to. You know, it's hard, and and I know probably you can maybe understand this when you're so on the road all the time yeah. and busy. Um, that's super hard to get the time that you might like. I think people have this vision of touring as, as like you're just lying on the tour bus luxuriously reading and, you know, having <laughs> hours a day, but it, it's really never like that. And so I don't read as much as I would like. Um, yeah. I, I mean, but when I can, I do. Yeah. 
Um, so back back to school. Um, was your first exposure to music? Was that in? Was it was it in your home? Was it in middle school? Was it in high, like what was your first music you really? Yeah, did I into? mean, I was, I I was really into. So my older sister, um, when I was even in elementary school, she was. You know, I remember her playing like Pure Prairie League, which is that song, Amy, you know, yeah. Amy, what you want to do? Like that's yeah. that song still. I know every note, every word, every guitar note, you know, I can hum the guitar solo, you know, awesome. so, so stuff like that. And, and then, um, I, you know, obviously Beatles, like the red album and the blue album, white album. And then, you know, so all that stuff was kind of elementary school. And then I remember in middle school, I won this, um, this, this English contest, right? Like in yeah. English class. And this is, they probably couldn't do that anymore, but I lived in France when I was in seventh and eighth grade. So maybe awesome. that's why they could get away with it. But, uh, cause my dad worked for the state department, but, but so like I got this award and, and they actually give you money. Right. Which was so cool. Especially yeah. when you're 13 years old. Right. So I remember I went out and I bought Alice Cooper, uh, welcome to my nightmare. And I got, um, I got the Doobie Brothers Stampede, and I got a Kiss album, and um, and a Leonard. Sk- I got like in four albums, you know, because nice. like, it was like it was like seventy five dollars or something, you know, <laughs> or whatever. And I, so I got, of course, you know, like every kid, I spent every cent I had on music, which is what you should do. Totally. And like, so I remember it's like those albums, especially that Alice Cooper man. That was like my real introduction to to heavy rock. And and that was just like total door opener, mind blower, eye opener, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm still an Alice Cooper fan to this day. That's all. I mean, so your parents are pretty open minded and cool with like the music you were listening to, and they were supportive. And yeah, yeah. And then I, it always, I think, is like the music thing is so important for you and me yeah. to not only you know hopefully be like a, a good you know, role model as much as we can, you know, but also yep. to uh, encourage younger folks and, and help that torch get passed down. Cause like, I remember I had a friend in, in uh, ninth grade and his older brother was like, check out this band it's called the clash and the oh, Ramones. Wow. And, you know, and I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, and it just, all the, the explosions were going off in my head and <laughs> like complete life changing stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, so if you're an older guy, yeah, you know, believe it or not, even if you know you think the you know younger guys don't know anything, or you think they won't listen to you, um, they might listen to you, and they might really dig it. So yeah. don't give up on the younger guys. I love that. So, um, did you go to your first live concert when you were in high school? Do you remember what that was? Um, yeah, I think so. I think my one of my early ones that I remember was definitely the Doobie Brothers. Wow. And I think I went on a I think I went on a um, double date with some girl that I'd never met before because she was the friend of my friend's girlfriend. And, um, we went and saw, um, geez, who was that for that one? That was the Eagles. Nice. And, uh, you know, it's so a lot, of, a lot of rock, you yeah. know, classic rock type stuff. Now it wasn't called classic rock. Then it's just rock. Yeah. But and- it was great. Yeah. And then I can't remember my first, my first punk show was definitely probably one of the DC bands in, in the, you know, 79, 80, 81 frame. Wow. So you probably, I'm sure you saw a minor threat and all. And of course I did. Yeah. Amazing. You know, amazing band. One of my favorite minor threat shows is probably one that Ian might remember. I think it was at the nine thirty club, the old one. And he had lost his voice and he had a sign and he, three signs, three, three like cardboard piece of thing. He held one up, said, I have the next one said lost. And then third one said my voice. So, <laughs> and, and he, they went on, and regardless of his voice status, man, they killed it. I'm and sure. everybody in the audience was going berserk and singing along to help him out. And it was just such a, a fraternal, you know, a team thing and, like, the spirit. And, yeah, it was, was amazing. That's amazing. So how soon – so what year did you leave um, that the area, Virginia area to head to Boston? Like, so – yeah, so eighty one. So yeah, 81. I I, uh, I moved up to to Boston in eighty one, and um, you know it was weird. You know, I've always had these things where I kind of to to like have these. I love a place, and then I'll just you know life will take me on a you know path, you know, and yeah. I, and I might have to go somewhere. So I mean, you know, 
like you're, you know, you're in California, you know, from, you know, have Massachusetts roots and New York roots, and, yep. you know, um, so life doesn't, you know, especially in America, we tend to be more mobile, I think, than, yeah. than other places, you know? I agree. So, but yeah, 81 was, uh, 81 was the year that I went up to Boston, which was great because the only band at that point, there were a couple, but yeah, the main band was a little band called Society System Decontrol that, you know, was just getting started. And there were like eight people in the scene and I was number nine or whatever, you know, so it was, it was, it was great. I mean, they were the first, some of the first people I met and the band, you know, was staggeringly brilliant and uh, uh, ferocious and like just, a step up in hardcore that from anything I'd ever seen in terms of toughness and uh, ferocity. Yeah. Especially back then too. Um, so different. Um, so then how old were you when you started DYS? So I was, uh, I guess like 18, right? 18, that's crazy, maybe, man. maybe 19. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was crazy. Um, and that's your first that band. Story, sorry. That's your first band you sang in. Yeah. First band. So I was in a band in, in high school I think we were called for a while. We had different names. I think we were called General Disorder for a while. And we did songs, you know, like a lot of rock songs and a couple of punky songs. But that was like the sort of just toe in the water. And yeah. then, um, I sang all through all through um, high school and high school musicals, you know. Oh, wow. I was in all the musicals in high school. So I, I really love musicals, even today, you know, like Singing in the Rain and Sound of Music and Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. That's and, amazing. You know. My Fair Lady, all that stuff. Yeah, I, um, like again, Dork, King Dork, right? So. <laughs> yeah, but you, but but I was wondering, like, if yeah, that makes sense now because if that's the first band you sang in, it's like you're a great singer and you have you have great melodies and you know what I mean you have, a, you have a strong voice for it. So that's that's good to know that you were doing that in school. That's where it came from. Like you, you figured out you could sing and you could keep a melody. You know what I mean? I think. Oh, thanks, brother. Yeah, it was definitely helpful. I'm sure listening to all that just kind of seeped into my. DNA, you know? Yeah. The other thing that's really cool that I had that was kind of unique, and I have not passed this torch on, unfortunately, but my dad was really into um, classical music. Like, I mean, he could whistle along to Beethoven or Mozart. And to me, I like all that stuff, but it kind of sounds the same. Like, I don't have the the knowledge, you know, to, 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 to distinguish you know, I do a little bit, but not anywhere near like what my dad had. But yeah. he would whistle along to Beethoven for hours. And when you listen to classical music, one of the things that's really interesting from a musical and musician standpoint is how many layers there are. Mm. I mean, classical music has, you know, think about a whole symphony orchestra. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's the violins are playing something and the cellos are supporting that, but playing their own notes and on top of that is the, you know, the horns and, and those are each have their own things. And so, yeah. you know, classical music is amazing to understand layering and, and crescendos and, and, you know, bringing it down to a quiet point in a song. And, you know, and then all of a sudden, dun, 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 you know, like, yeah. and, and then you just kind of, you kind of like, really, it's, it's like a roller coaster. It's a musical roller coaster for classical music. So yeah. um, I kind of grew up with that as well in my, again, in my DNA, like just my dad whistling along to Beethoven or whatever. And cool. so, yeah. And so then, so then DYS, you, you're, 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 you're singing, but you're not really singing like you are in Diagnosis. So this one's more like, it's more aggressive the DYS, I would say, right? Yeah. So, you know, and I, I bet you, you and I could talk for a long time about like theories of how to attack a song or how to totally. you know, fit. Yeah. But for me, I've always tried to let the music dictate what I was going to sing. That's and cool. and by that, I mean, like, I don't want to be the guy who just sounds like one thing and only sounds like that. And that's cool yep. for those who do like, and there's some like, like Tom Waits or whatever, right? Like you hear Tom Waits and you don't like this and you know, he, he's great. Yeah. He, Tom Waits is an amazing vocalist, but not a lot of difference in what he does and that, that works for him. Yeah. But, but if I think if you're a singer, which you are, and um, you can adapt what you do a little bit here and there. And, mm-hmm. and I don't mean like try and be, you know, Michael Jackson on one song and try and be, you know, James Hetfield on another song, <laughs> but like, just like, you know, you, you have the ability to, you know, if you have an amplifier, right, a guitar amp, yep. there's, there's, let's say you have a Marshall JCM 800, which is, you know, by far the best, you know, amplifier, you know, head in the world, has like eight knobs. And, you know, there's, there's, you know, volume, tone, you know, treble, middle, bass, 
you know, like maybe it didn't go seven. I don't know how many knots are on a Marshall JCM 800, but, but not yeah. many, but you can adjust it. Right. And, and you don't want to just have your, your amp be the same setting for every song. That's why guitar players have pedals mm-hmm. and, and they change their, you know, and sometimes they use their, their, you know, whammy bar and sometimes they don't, and sometimes they're playing muted chords and sometimes they're playing full open ragers. And yep. so that kind of thing is, like how I view a real musician for me anyway, for how I approach songs. Like if somebody's playing songs like DYS, what spoke to me, what was calling to me was get your inner demon out, man, and and Mm -hmm. get it out there. And so I didn't plan it, but I just let it take me. The wave took me where it needed to take me. Yeah. And that's why when, when, uh, you know, when, when I joined Dagnasty, that wave was a very different wave from DYS and more grown up and, and it opened up some different doors and I let that wave kind of take me where that was going to go and, you know, so on and so forth. I love that. And, and was, was DYS was, um, so brotherhood was the first one, right? If I'm correct. Yeah. Yeah, man. Brotherhood, so, and that was, yeah. was that where and we Dickie see Barrett, that was like Dickie Barrett drew that cover. Oh, he did. Holy yeah, shit. Yeah. Dickie, nobody knows that. Um, but he, he's actually on the back cover of that album and, um, but Dickie Barrett drew that cover we had a couple different people do some variations of the monks. We knew we wanted like the idea of like, you know, cause we we're so into the discipline of straight edge and mm-hmm. what it represented. And, um, and Dickie Barrett drew that amazing cover. Yeah. Wow. Shout out to Dickie Barrett, man. I remember seeing impact unit, like one of their shows back then. It was pretty cool. Oh, you saw impact unit. Nice. Yeah. yeah with vicious circle. And Robo Saul. It was like one of my first shows. It was in, um, in Providence, uh, maybe Lupo's or something of the first ones. Yeah. I still have the flyer. Oh, Lupo's, boy, a lot of memories. You just brought back like 30 <laughs> memories. That's awesome. With Proletariat, Idle Rage, I think Straw Dogs or something. I don't know. I have the flyer. I have to look at it. But, um, so that's that, great. Yeah, so that's so yeah, that's amazing. So you were coming from the D.C., Virginia area to, into Boston. And it was and the, the whole straight edge element during that time was way different than the D.C. vibe. Yeah, we were more militant about it, yeah. I think, honestly, in, in Boston. Um, we were. I, I, I can't. You know, I think looking back, would I do everything now the same as I did back then to the point of being so militant? Yeah. Maybe not. But I'll tell you what, at the time, it seemed like the thing to do. And and what people now don't kind of realize is all of us, like, let's say it's 82 or whatever. Yeah. Man, you're coming out of this era of the 70s and 60s. First of all, of course, you know, drug culture and everything of the 60s. But yeah. then, and you know, that produced some greatness, right? Like Hendrix and and Keith Moon and all these guys. You know, Jim Morrison, all of those guys were they all died of drugs, but they also used drugs to their creative, you know, energies. Totally. But um, but like, uh, but you got that, and then you go into the 70s when it's just like you know excess and you know everybody you know pot and excesses mm-hmm. whatever. And so we came out of this era, you know, those of us who are that, you know, in our, in that era, era in that age, it was just like, man, we were sick of it. And we'd also seen a lot of friends go down with just becoming stoners or yep. worse, you know? So totally. man, for me, I, I just was like, I didn't know I was straight edge, but I was straight edge. And then I, you know, kind of heard when threat threatened, I'm like, Oh wait, that's me, you yep. know? And then, and then I went to Boston and Al, you know, Burrill, who's, you know, just an amazing you know icon yep. and one of my you know one of my heroes kind of and and like he was like not only am i straight edge but i'm gonna freaking make it front and center of my of my being and i was yeah. like that's that's me you know that's what i want that that's the guy that that i'm gonna you know like support and take yeah. after so yeah yeah that's amazing yeah it was so powerful like the photos from then, the the footage from then, just those iconic photos, everybody with their jackets on and stuff. That's that's like big part of hardcore. Yeah, history, it really man. was. And and there were like, you know, twenty of us, right, in the Boston crew or something. I mean, it was so small, you know, maybe, you know, if you added up everybody and all the bands that were in that early era, you could say thirty or forty like the Wolfpack song says. But you know, <laughs> there were that was you know, there weren't a lot of us, man, and there were fights all the time and people, you know, we were we were we stood out like as much as like probably a spiky haired punk guy did in, in London in 1977 or whatever, like Johnny Rotten. Yep. But I, I mean, we stood out that much in Boston shaves head with leather jackets, spray painted on the back and combat boots and torn jeans. I mean, and then, Crazy. you know, then we went into like the whole sneakers thing that yeah. we were all kind of doing. And that was all very organic. It was like, yeah, I wear sneakers cause I need to 
go fast if I'm in the whatever in the pit or if I'm getting a, <laughs> you know getting in a scrap or whatever you know like, really that, that's what it was for that's crazy that's that's amazing yeah none of it was planned it was just kind of all organic wow you know? and so was so was did did DYS tour or did you guys more like a tri-state area band did you guys play a lot of shows or on the country. We, we didn't tour very much and neither did SSD actually, you know, um, SSD did one thing out to California, um, where they played Santa Monica civic center and, and they drove straight there. I think if the wow. story, if I'm remembering it right, they drove all the way out there to play this one huge show, which they did. And, um, and then they drove all the way back and like, that's that they just were, you know, that's just amazing pedal to the metal and, and same thing with DYS, you know, I mean, we did a couple of mini tours. Like we went down to Richmond and Baltimore yeah. um, and, uh, and we played in Connecticut. And I remember we, my dad at the, my, my parents at the time were living in um, Greenwich, Connecticut. Yeah. My dad was, was working up there. So we stayed with the, it was FUs and, and DYS and we stayed at my parents' condo. And um, I still remember this. We were, we were in the, it was a pretty nice condo, right? Like far nicer than we were. <laughs> that we should have been allowed to be in. And so we were playing Marco Polo in the pool. And first of all, everyone was horrified by us because at this point, all of us had tattoos and yeah. we all, you know, we're, you know, and, and then, but Steve Grimes was from the FUs, who's the guitar player, he's a great guy. Um, he lunged at somebody, you know, he was it in Marco Polo and he, he bashed his head into the, into the side of the pool. So all of a sudden there's blood coming into the pool. People are screaming and like <laughs> my mother, my mother gets a call from the head of the, you know, whatever, or the homeowners association or whatever. <laughs> we were, we brought disgrace and shame to, to my family. You know? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Those were the days. Greenwich Connecticut would never be the same. That's, that's amazing, man. I can just vision that too. Like some eighties punk movie yeah. or some shit. Like, yeah, yeah. I wish we had all that stuff on. Nowadays, we would have everything on videotape, but or on you know on our phones. But with back then, nobody had anything. So a lot of it's just memories that you pass it down. You know, pass down the memories like we're doing right now. Yeah. And so, what was your parents thinking about you being being in a hardcore band as, as at that young age, just getting to Boston and were you high, were, you, were that, you a senior? Or you already graduated when you were in the band. No, I graduated. Okay. I graduated from from BI, and then I went up to Boston. So I was like a freshman in college oh, at that okay. point, eighteen. So um, I think, like, for me, the the thing that I really it was that we didn't have any rules, and mm -hmm. it's so strange, you know. Like everything we were doing was was on its own. There was no there was no um, no roadmap for it. Yep. So we were kind of making it up all our own, and you felt this kind of sense of fear all the time because you might get jumped by the jocks mm -hmm. or, or you also felt sometimes, um, this, this almost constant, uh, excitement and like, I'm going to go down to Kenmore square and see who's hanging out there. Or yeah. I'm going to go down to Newberry comics and, you know, and see what's going on. And it was just, uh, like this constant sense of like, you never knew what was next. Right. Yeah. So it was just, super super like this sense of you know you're always breaking a new horizon you know like, yeah it's kind of cool and and that sense of i gotta be honest too like the, the boston crew was like my gang and you know yeah. we were gang you know not in a like we didn't do like gang stuff like that yeah. break law stuff yeah but but well we did spray paint and, and put up flyers illegally yeah, i suppose right. and stuff but you know but but like the, the sense of brotherhood there yeah. you know that album's called brotherhood for a reason totally you know I, I i still love those guys i still they're all still friends of mine on facebook certainly and if i i know if i went to boston and called any of them they would come to you know to awesome. come out to dinner or whatever yeah. you know yeah that's amazing so how many years was dys for then seems like it was, it was long. For pretty much like four years okay, you that's know long like back the then time yeah. Like back then, yeah, yeah, like 81, <laughs> 82 to 85-ish, you know. And, yeah. Um, you know, we were, again, everything was so honest. You know, we kind of all got better at our instruments, and, and I was like, wait, I don't have to just scream. I can also mm. sing because I know how to sing. So all of a sudden we kind of, and we all listened to Iron Maiden and Priest and, you know, Venom and, you know, all this stuff. And, and um, you know, we and Rose Tattoo, you nice. know, all these bands. So, so we, we kind of just like, um, 
all grew at the same time as musicians and became yeah. this sort of rock band. You know, same thing with, was going on with SSD. You know, they right. they kind of were like getting better and better at their instruments. And Chris Foley was this amazing drummer, and they got a second guitar player, and then Francois, who was really, really you know great. And they yeah. all listened to the same stuff we did, and um, so they had this kind of rock, you know, under under you know a beating heart of rock and rock in there heavy metal and rock in their soul so yeah we all just kind of grew at the same time and it was really interesting to see it happen um yeah so people back then hated rock and metal you guys are playing like jock stuff and i was gonna say that how was it how was it received yeah not well and that's Um, pre-internet too so yeah. (laughs) yeah right right yeah like i remember some guy i remember there was a guy in maximum rock and roll um named Dog, who reviewed our second record. That was his rating name, was Dog. Mm. Uh, as soon as I saw his name was Dog, I was like, uh-oh, this isn't going to go well, you know. And I <laughs> and I read the review, and of course, it was like, these guys are jocks, and they're, you know, assholes, and they're, you know, Damn. They blah, 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 you know. So, But luckily, Dog is a, I, I don't think Dog is a prominent musical voice anymore, and <laughs> people still know DYS. So. Yeah, there you go. But back then, like getting a review in that magazine is a big deal, though, for sure. Flipside or Maximum Rock and Roll or something. It's like, do you have yeah, name I always in thought Flipside was was way cooler yeah. than Maximum Rock and Roll. Yeah, I agree. I loved Flipside, and they yeah. they covered the skater culture, which was a yep. uh, a really important part of punk that I think people don't realize too, maybe yeah. nowadays. And so, yeah, I, I dug Flipside a lot, and Thrasher, of course. Did you, you know, skate? Was the other big one? I skated badly, so got to <laughs> know. Um, I mean, I did skate around, like I'd skate to like go to the store yeah. or, you know, stuff like that. But I broke my wrist three times oh, man. and not doing anything cool. Like not, this isn't like pools or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, so I just, I just, you know, after a while I said, you know what? I think my feet are better off, uh, on, on the ground, but <laughs> I loved it. And I love the, I love the, the, the freedom of it and the yes. independence of it and the, you know, just the culture, yes. you know? So, so I am a skater by heart, I would say. Got you. I mean, I mean, it went yeah. hand in hand with the with the culture. Yeah, with like all all those videos, the Bones Brigade, and all the skate videos back then. The VHS they had all like amazing punk soundtracks with Youth Brigade and the Faction and JFA. All that stuff. Yeah, it was so connected, man. Such a big yeah, part. Yeah, man. yeah. So Down by Law played with uh, JFA not too long ago. Um, oh, last really? Year or two out oh, in California. Wow. Yeah, and they were great. Yeah, it was That's super amazing. cool. And of course, you know. I, I knew almost all their songs and they were super good dudes and yeah, it was great. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean Beach Blanket Bong Out, like all that stuff was just Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. So what did you uh what what kind of stuff were you listening to in the eighties? I mean you're a little younger, so you you know, but you obviously saw some of these bands that you're mentioning that were super early, like Impact Unit or whatever. Yeah, know, okay, that's so. good. That's when I lived in Massachusetts and then I when I moved to Newport, that's when I met john jones he was in positive outlook and his brother was chris jones from verbal assault and we were best friends me and john so that's where i really get into that's where i actually got into skateboarding it was newport rhode island it was a massive scene there and it was vicious circle and i think idle rich um oh sure and so yeah and so we that's where i i guess was part of my skate crew was in newport and um there was ramps on first beach and there was all these shows it was the blue pelican in newport and we'd go to shows the living room so yeah, it was mostly local bands until in 1985. Um, Descendants came on, came to the living room province. That was the first out of town band I've ever saw, and I love Descendants. I love that record. I think it was I don't want to grow up in '85, and that was the first out of town band I saw. I was like, holy shit, I was blown away because I, I don't I don't see awesome. yeah I'd only seen the bands that I was friends with, which were great. I support it was like a total local scene vibe, but then when these other bands started coming there, then Seven Seconds is like a game changer and like. Yeah, just all all that stuff I really connected to, um, and and also the skate rock stuff. I could really, I, I mean, my brothers got me to the Sex Pistols and stuff, but I can't really relate to the Sex Pistols. Um, I'm not, yeah, I don't know, just the more aggressive the, things, I guess. The, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, the Pistols were great because they were like this rock band that that like uh, you know they were a rock and roll band. People I think don't realize how, how good the guitar playing is on that album. Mm-hmm. Like Steve Jones is great. He's a great rock guitar player. And, yeah. um, but they were this rock band that totally upset the apple cart of rock, you know? 
Yeah. Um, so they they were they were you know super great for that reason. And what a great I mean, really just one record. I mean, you could argue great rock and roll swindle is a second mm. record, but it's not really. So they had one record. They came out. They like exploded like a you know like a supernova, and then they just dissipate. I mean, how punk rock is that? That's, it's pretty you know, punk. That, that, yeah, it was so impactful. Punk. And then like, yeah, it's interesting because. It wasn't glamour. I mean, Sid Vicious, people love him and like he's like a hero to people, but my heroes are still alive and like people loved him. He was cool, but I wasn't into the whole, the crazy drugs part. I mean, obviously I love Sid and Nancy movie. I love the documentaries. I love those records, but I, I, I couldn't connect to it on that level. You know what I mean? Totally. I totally agree. Yep. Yep. I, that's why I kind of like, like, I know this is blasphemy too, but like uh, the New York Dolls and Johnny Thunders and all that stuff, like totally respect it and and get it, but I couldn't connect with the whole, you know, heroin stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and for, for Johnny Thunders. And, you know, I know there are people that, you know, kind of, um, you know, I, I, I think they gave him a pass on it. And, but, but, you know, and, and, you know, again, I'm not judging anybody because everybody has their own path. In totally. Life, but, um, but for me, it wasn't my path and I never wanted that for me. Yeah. You know, so, 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 so after that, that last DYS record, we guys kind of, change your style up a little bit right more rock vibe um how long was that the last record i'm pretty sure it was right that was our last record yeah yeah, yeah i mean the interesting thing is in recent years we've done some singles here and there and, yeah and i um, saw that we're actually going to go play rebellion fest this year nice. UIS is playing rebellion it's a great in, fest uh in 2020 yeah well oh, this awesome. year meaning next year but yeah 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 i'm super stoked on it and um you know, um, we're gonna uh, Fran Stahl from from Scream, Scream. is gonna he's he's a he's a part of DYS now and um, wow. has been for for any of our reunion shows and he's amazing as a both both as a you know friend person yeah, and yeah. as a player and uh, you know uh, the, the uh, you know the, the whole band sounds pretty damn tight so I'm mm-hmm. really excited about it. That is really cool. Um, yeah, you, you play any Cali shows. Any what? Sorry, California shows. Oh man, I wish. Uh, no, not currently. But I'll I'll uh, I'll turn up the Bunsen burner on Jonathan Anastas, who is our ringleader of crime, and see nice. if he can um, see if he can do anything with it. They all live out in California, actually. Oh so yeah. Adam, our guitar, our lead guitarist, Franzi, and and Jonathan all live out in in L.A. In fact, I don't know if you and Jonathan are friends already. But yeah, I, I run into totally. him. I ran into a bunch. Yeah, I think when he first, yeah, I did run into him a couple of times out here. Yeah, yeah, you get you guys. He has a shaved swap head. Stories all day. He does. Yep, yep. yep. He, I don't think he ever grew it out after 1981, man. <laughs> I think that was it. You know, that's awesome. Yeah, so yeah, I run yep. into him out here. Um, all right, so how how so what happens after DYS is done? Is there is are you so, done before Dagnasty? Yeah. Yeah, so we broke up in '85, and and I remember we were at um, Charlie's, which was a uh, kind of a steak dinerish place in Kenmore Square and we met at Charlie's and it was just time. It wasn't even yeah. like a bad thing. We kind of said, yeah, it's time. And we'd been wavering on whether or not we were going to go full in on the metal and, mm. you know, or keep one foot in the punk rock world, which, you know, we all kind of love still. And, yeah. um, but, but basically it, it just seemed like it was time for you, the, the seasons had changed yeah. and, and it was time to turn the, the, the page. And so we, we actually broke up and then had, like our dinner together like it was like no that's amazing no acrimony no bitterness you yeah, know we all just friends. got our hamburgers and friends yeah and then um so i moved back down to dc and uh, almost as soon as i did um brian baker who i knew from you know the shared punk groups that we had totally. um, uh he he got me um uh, called me and we got together and I remember driving around in his, he had a Honda CRX, a red Honda CRX, nice. which is like kind of a sporty little red Honda thing. And, um, he played me the demos of his band and, and, uh, you know, and, and I really loved the music so much. And, and, uh, he said, you know, I, you know, he asked me to, to join, you know, they asked me to join, you know, not that long after that. So, so the can I say demos? There's a backstory there, but basically, yeah, he played some of the can I say Damn. demos for me. Yeah, and then I actually roadied for them for a while. Okay, um, and and there were some tensions in the band with with uh, Sean. Their oh, singer, that's right, that's and, right. Sean was first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Sean was their singer, and there were some tensions there, and um, so they they called me up one night and said, "Hey, you know, we just you know parted ways, and 
we need you to sing desperately because we have a tour scheduled and will you do it? And I said, yeah, heck yeah. And I knew all the words cause I'd been a roadie and, and I, it was really cool because I think I was the, at that point, that was the best we could have been like the, the four of us were really on point and it really synced like really like gelled like musically. It was like, and I remember when we recorded, can I say, in Don Zantero's basement, it was Don Zantero's yep. own inner ear uh, studios, um, and we're, his early days were, in, and it was in his basement. And um, I mean, some legendary stuff was recorded in that oh, basement. Yeah. But um, and his little daughters would come up; they're so cute, and they'd come up between takes and stuff. But but anyways, cool. um, so uh, we, we were recording, and there was the sense. You know, Toby, that I I think you probably had it. I'm sure you have because you've done some amazing stuff where you just know it's something different and exciting. Yes. And, like you feel that that karma. I don't know what the word is. Mm-hmm. So if I if I could bottle it and package it, I would. You know. Yeah. But, totally. Um, it was something special. It was in the air. You know, it was like a magic feeling, and it just was like everybody knew it. We felt it, and um, you know, uh, it was it was really great. Uh, the, just the vibe. You know, as we were recording again, I say it was the spark and it, yeah. was, it was kind of a magical moment who named the band Dag Nasty you know I think if memory serves Colin the drummer yep, Colin uh, named it that um, yeah and and I think he it was either he or Brian was was called that by somebody like it may have been even like a, a, a homeless person on the street mm. said that boy's Dag Nasty like oh, that boy's Dag Nasty shit. And so I think that's where the name came from. I uh, love that. Again, if memory serves. And then Colin definitely found the Flaming Head logo. That for sure I do remember. Um, so perfect. He found that logo in a book of like old horror things or something. Oh, wow. You know? Yeah. How long did that record take to record? Do you remember? Not long, man. We didn't have any time <laughs> or money or, you know, it, that's another thing that added to the, to the, to the burning quality that was captured on that two inch yeah. you know, tape was, you know, there was a sense of urgency about it. Just like, you know, same thing with the first with Brotherhood, you know, from yep. UIS. Like, that, you know, we we were, you know, there was no second takes. There was no, you know, maybe there was, but no third takes, that's for sure. You know, and, um, you know, we just had to nail it. And so that adds to the sense of just burning pressure, which translates to musical intensity. Yeah. And I, and I feel like just lyrically from DOS, DYS to Diagnosti, it's such a, I want to say deeper lyrics, but I don't know. The, the lyrics are just, I don't know, man. They're just, they're coming from a different, they're coming from you, but they're coming from uh, maybe it's a, the time you were in or whatever. Just some really yeah, powerful I think, lyrics, man. I think, thanks. And, and some of those were written by Baker, you know, and, um, and, and I think that uh, there was, but they connected like, even if somebody else writes a lyric, if, if you're a singer, you make it your own or you don't. And yep. it comes from your heart or it doesn't. Totally. And, for me, man, everything we did, it just clicked and connected. And there is this just palpable energy, man. I've never really seen anything like it in my career. I mean, like Down by Law does these things where you know it's like, okay, that song is freaking great. But yeah. you're not 18 anymore or 21 or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, you're you're more of a seasoned musician. And you, you, feel, you feel that sense of, of power, or like, the, you know, with the Bandoleros or with Don't Sleep, which is my, you know, the Bandoleros and Don't Sleep are my you know, two uh, bands that I'm doing right now as yep. well as of course down by law. But, but like you feel those moments and you feel that energy and that brilliance and that passion and that, but it's just to be 21 or 22 and doing that, it was a, you can't replicate that Cannot. and you can't, you know, so it was, it was a, it was really an exciting time. And how, how was that proceed when it came out? Like what was, what was the response that you remember? Like brand new band, new album, yeah, it was really great, and uh, and it was like a lot of people were, you know, oh my God, this is you know groundbreaking and blah blah blah, and then mm-hmm. I quit, um, which is my big, you know, one of my big what if moments. Everybody has those. In oh, life, totally. You know? um, and but for me, I got into grad school and uh, on a full scholarship, and wow. I, my parents had told me they couldn't, you know, couldn't afford to send me, so it was either take the scholarship or um, or don't. And the, the thing that's really stupid that we did, I think is we got in, we, I know per, per year, we didn't talk to each other. We hated each other, you know, and, and stuff because Brian was really angry that I quit. Mm-hmm. And, 
and and so but i didn't have to quit like i was just gonna i got the original the re- original thing that i was gonna leave for is i got a scholarship to nyu oh wow but new york to dc is a four-hour train ride yeah, you know easy. like yeah. it's nothing like we could have kept it going but you know back then we were kind of i was i'll speak for myself i was young <laughs> and dumb and you know and so I, you know, I got to quit, man. I'm going to grad school. You know, I could have gone to grad school and still, you know, Holy come down shit. twice a month. And yeah, it's always a big what if, right? Yeah. So how everybody long, has them and yeah. that was mine. So how long after the record came out did you quit? Right as it was coming out. Damn. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. That is crazy. So, um, yeah. And then, then it was actually the interesting thing was we didn't even have time to consider a reconciliation because I then ended up instead of going to NYU, I got um, a chance to go over to Israel and live for a year and go to grad school in Israel. Wow. So that's what I did, which was freaking amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. It was really super cool, man. It was, it was amazing. Like just <sighs> mind blowing, you know, kind of every day. It was kind of mind blowing, you know, so there was I ne- loved Israel. Israel was great. So there was never a tour really on, can I say? We did a couple small tours. Um, we toured uh, through the Midwest with the Descendants, actually. Nice. You know, you're talking about how good they were. Yes. So, yeah, and I knew Billy from when he'd been in Black Flag, and then we obviously, you know, we're touring together again with the Descendants and Dead Nasty and, yeah. like, Detroit at the Greystone and stuff like that. And then um, and then that actually helped us really connect so that then later when I was in Israel and Jerusalem, you know, Mike Gitter called me up and... Um, for those who don't know Mike, he yeah. did the famous fanzine, XXX fanzine, and um, was a very accomplished writer and, and also was a label guy and discovered some really big bands. Yeah. Um, and so, so, but Mike called me up in, in Israel, and I knew him from, from the Boston crew, you know, days. Yeah. And, and he said, hey, you know, Bill Stevenson wants to get in touch with you. I'm like, hey, sounds good. You know, guy's awesome. You know, so, so Billy, Billy called me and we talked for hours and hours on the phone and, um, and he, Bill told me later that his phone bill was like a thousand dollars because, you know, we were on the phone for so many, multiple calls, long calls. And, but, you know, he told me about this vision that he had, you know, that Milo was going back to school and he had this vision for this band called all, and we're going to go for all and, you know, you know, pedal to the metal, you know, all in. And, and I was like, yeah, man, I, he, he, he was so convincing. And, um, you know, of course he, he's Bill Stevenson. So you were, you, you're like, Oh my gosh, this yeah, guy's such a talent, you know, like yeah. one of the most talented musicians I've ever not just worked with or, but like have heard of, right. Like mm-hmm. he's just, he's, he's great. And, um, so yeah. And so he, Bill Stevenson, I quit grad school after a year and uh, moved back out to California and, or moved out to California and joined all. Holy crap. So how old were you then? Mm, I'm going to say young 20s, maybe like 23, 24, wow, something like man. that. Yeah. Those records are great. Too. All Roy Says and All Roy Saves, right? Those are the two. No, so I was on All Roy, all Roy for Prez and All Roy Says. Yeah. The so those Prez the two is- that I was on at that. Oh my God. Yeah, I wasn't dude. on saves. Yeah. Yeah, but the, it was great and such a unique thing. And I'm actually playing with them. Uh, I'm not sure when this is going to, you know, be live or whatever, but I'm playing with them on um, in, in on November 23rd, like in a week and a half or Where whatever. It? Where? In, um, in Fort Collins. It's for a, so the Bill owns a studio yes, called yep. The Blasting Room. Yep. And um, have you guys recorded out there at no, all? No, I'd love to, though, man. Oh man, I, I, I think you should. And Bill's, of course, because he's so talented. Like, if you, I mean, I know it's like he's booked up like a yeah. year or more in advance, but boy, you and he, I think, would be a great combo. Um, so I'm putting the seed in your brain Thank right you, now. I'm going to water times. it. Yeah, he's awesome, man. Yeah, and, and you guys would love it. And, um, you know, um, he, he's great. And all his, his, the whole team out there is great. And I actually haven't recorded there directly either, but I know all the work and he's mixed some stuff and he mixed the new, um, Dave Smalley and the Bandoleros album that's coming out. Um, oh, early awesome, man. Next year. Yeah. And, um, of course he did amazing, but, but, uh, you know, we're, we're going to go do this show and in celebration of the blasting rooms, 25th anniversary. That's awesome. So, you play those old songs too. 
Yeah, we're doing uh, like all songs from All Roy Says and All Roy for Prayers. Just and, skin so. deep. I love that shit, man. Oh my god. <laughs> So many Thanks. good songs you know on there, the man. scary thing is? That was 1988, man, and, and uh, that was 30-plus years ago. So wow. ask anybody what you said and did and then try and have them recreate that exactly 30-plus years mm. later. <laughs> it is hard. It's, I'm working like a, like a you know. That's I'm, crazy. Yeah, I'm, I'm listening to this stuff like, oh, my gosh. You know, I got to remember all this stuff. Is it weird going back and so. listening to it and li- listening to the lyrics and all that stuff? Is it? Take you back, it takes you back, right? It does, yeah. And those were those were great days, man. That was a that was the first time I was in a band that we were a full time band. You know, yeah. I wasn't like working or going to school or whatever. And um, you know, we we all lived like you know very very poor, dirt poor, like you know. Uh, but we also, you know, were loving it, and we were able to survive just as yeah. this group living together and practicing and working and uh, you know and singing and. Playing. Did you write Wishing Well? You know, I wrote Wishing Well. Well, so I wrote, uh, let me think about this. I think I wrote the words to Wishing yeah. Well. And Carl wrote the music, I think, uh, if memory serves. Um, I can't remember if I wrote the music on that one, too, or not. Um, I might have. There's some great uh, songs but, on yeah, the track, man. Wow. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm actually doing that one. The next night, I'm not doing Wishing Well on the the Saturday night of the 23rd. I'm doing it the next night in a solo show on the 24th. Oh, nice. Yeah. So how was All Received when it came out? Because it's not Milo. Was that was that was that uh, stressful a little bit or no? Wait, I'm sorry. Can you repeat? Like when All came out, was that how was that received back then? Because it wasn't Milo. Um, It wasn't Descendants. It was yeah. It was it was received pretty well, but I think it's definitely took time for people's musicals ear musical ears to to open up a little bit because yep. it was so different you know as you know because you've done you know extremely pioneering stuff um sometimes you're ahead of the curve mm-hmm. you know and and so sometimes that you know that is like uh and sometimes that works for you and sometimes it works against you yes. and um i think in in but in all's case it was both you know people were like holy holy shit you know but also they were they were like some some people were you know like it's too whatever it's too produced it's too whatever but then you know then those same people years later would say you know i i was wrong you know in 1988 yeah. when that album came out i was wrong about that it's a great album you know so yeah you know you just but as an artist all you can do is be yourself and i think the greatest yep. you know if punk rock and hardcore taught you or me or, you know, our, our brethren and sister and, you know, anything is like, it's like if you follow your heart and yep. you believe in what you're saying or singing or playing or, you know, that you're going to be okay because at the end of the day, you can stare yourself in the mirror. You can, um, you know, go to sleep at night and you can know that you, you made, you did your best to make a positive dent. Yeah. Know? I agree so. with that hundred percent. And I, I feel, I feel like, I feel like those records, people, I think those records, people love those records so much still all. Like, people love those records, man. You know what I mean? Like, Thanks. Yeah, they do. I, I remember I posted a thread about how much I loved being in all um, mm-hmm. on my Facebook page. And yeah. um, there were, like, hundreds of people, like, you know, who liked that thing, like, many hundreds, you know? And I was like, wow. I, I was so happy, you know? It made me really happy that, that, you know, people still loved it, you know? Yeah, because when you're in um, it and you're doing it back then – it's it's so different now looking back on things now like that many years ago. But when you're in it and you're playing this stuff, you're doing it because you're with your friends. You love you writing songs. You're not really thinking about like I don't know the the impact of these records that are like still powerful today. Even with can I say like just when I hear that when I hear that record, I get goosebumps still just hearing those songs because it puts me in a, um, a place a a time in my life when I just first heard you guys or because I saw. I saw Dag Nasty with all three singers. I was lucky enough to see that in DC. So I saw. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And so, but just if the, the memories of this hearing those songs and how this, and that record sounds so good still. And it's just like, I don't know, just that time. And I feel like it, it lasts throughout all these decades that people are still picking up the all records and the Dag you know that, I mean? that means a lot. It's true that like staples you know, you are just, part of it, you know? You, you remind me of a scene from when we were tracking can I say, and I saw Ian when I was doing a vocal track, Ian was kind of looking serious and shaking his head, you know, and I 
and then over and said, hey, you know, what's going on? Oh, and shit. he said, well, and, you know, and you're thinking, okay, Ian MacKay is <laughs> shaking his head. This is, you know, this is terrible, you know. Scary. And, um, you know, because, of course, I loved Minor Threat with yes. a deep passion. And um, so so he goes, well, I was just thinking this is going to be one of our best records, man. Maybe one of the best Discord records ever. And I was like, oh, Holy cool. Sh- no pressure so, there. Uh, let, me go back to, <laughs> let me go back to the mic and uh, not fuck this up, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Holy it was great. shit. That's fucking awesome. Um, yeah, it was a very nice thing. And so, and so, all did some tours. I remember, I remember seeing you guys on. Um, oh, we toured nonstop. That yeah. was I toured. I was on the road for I. I want to say, if memory serves, it was about nine and a half months out of one year. Dang. My first year, and you know, you know. So, and I, I mean, the day that I got off the plane, I, I remember I. I sold my record collection in New Jersey. My girlfriend at the time lived in New Jersey and yeah. I sold my record collection and that was cool because, well, not cool, but I knew all the songs of every record and I was broke. So I was like, <laughs> I got to sell my record, but I, you know, and I'm selling like misfits stuff and Dang. you know, the first, you know, first bat brains this and you know, all this stuff. So, but I, I felt like I knew it all in my heart and that was, that was what it was there for. And I plus I figured that. I was going to give other kids a chance to get this stuff, which I knew was hard to find mm-hmm. in 19, even by 1988, that stuff was or 87 or whatever year it was. That was hard to find. Yeah. And then, so, but word got around, like, you know, Dave Smalley sold his record collection and like people were like descending on the, you know, on the, uh, the record store. Cause yeah, they figured this, <laughs> you know, this, this guy probably has some stuff, you know, that's so, amazing. Yeah, and I'd worked at Newberry Comics in Boston, you know, wow. for, for years. Yeah. So I was able to get first co- first crack at, like, everything. At first Necro single, first, damn. you know, whatever. Yeah, so so I had a, you know, damn good record collection. Um, that, that, but yeah, I sold that, and I, I had enough money to, to you know, kind of to, to live for a little bit. And then I um, I, I flew out to to L.A., and they picked me up in, in, um, in the, the gray van, the all van, and and uh, everything was gray, right? Stefan, you know, <laughs> spray painted his, his clear Dan Armstrong guitar gray, and amps were all gray, and cabinets. Wow. And, and Bill's drum kit was gray. It was like the, the band color. And then um, um, they picked me up. We went to Alfredo's to eat, and then we freaking practiced, man. There was no, like, you know, no, like, hey, we'll get you used to California for a few days yep. and you know, get you used. No, 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 no. No, it was right away. They were, it was like so cool. I bet Bill was like a machine to work with too, man, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's awesome. So yeah. how many years did that last for all for you? For me, um, I mean, you know, they kept going after I quit. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was, uh, I think I was in for about a year and a half, something wow. like that. Yep. And you, and, uh, and you went in Dag Nasty for like not even a year, were you, For can I say that? Correct. Yeah. As far as, as far as my actual time being the singer. Yep. That's less than a year. Holy for crap. Sure. You made that record. Yeah, I, That's so crazy. <laughs> I know, right? It is. It is. It was. It was. You just should be like proud, man. Holy a, shit! Thanks, brother. Thanks. I, I, I'm. I'm just. You know. I'm so happy that you know. And this is not hot air. You know, guys like you that I love and respect, as you, a, both as a friend and as a musician. You know, like. Like the fact that you say that, that means a lot to me. Or the fact that anyone says it, really, you know, it's no. like, that's great. I mean, you know? just just looking, just to, did some research on you, like all the stuff you've been involved in, how many records you've been on. It's it's in, it's cr- I, had, I had no idea how many it, different records you've been. on. It's crazy, man, how much work you put out there. Thanks, brother. Well, you know, uh, go big or go home, right? So <laughs> that's it. Um. So did you? Was there a break in between all and down by law, and like what happened in between that? Like what? What are you doing? Um, so I, I quit all and um, and then I, I started to go back to, to grad school to start to try and finish up, you know, what I'd started in Israel. I love that. And then, um, yeah. and then uh, I was going to Cal State, Los Angeles. And then um, I just w- I wrote a few songs. I wrote a song called Down the Drain and uh, a song called, um, uh, let's see, uh, Right or Wrong was one of the first ones. And mm-hmm. just like four or five different songs. And, and I was friends with the chemical people who, who, um, had played with all many times. We were all very close friends. And so I just said, Hey, I wrote a few songs. Do you guys mind playing them with me? And they said, sure. And we did. And there was another, that was another time when it was like, Oh, this is kind of something. I don't know what it is, but it's something, mm-hmm. you know, one of them just like goofing around and, 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 you know, like just wasting time. It was like, there yeah. was a spark there. And, um, Ed Ehrlich, who's the bass player of chems and also, 
for Down by Law's first two records. Um, he he was this phenomenal bass is this phenomenal bass player, and Dave Naz was you know phenomenal drummer, and you know we just we, there was something going on, and it was uh, it was really cool, and we had a great time, and then before we knew it, uh, you know we just played a few shows, and then Brett Gerwitz from Epitaph was at the best. one of our early shows, and he I just still remember him saying. You know, he went to see us, and then he said, "Come out to my Volvo. I want to talk to you." I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know. And so we go out to Brett's Volvo, and he's talking to us, and he's telling us about Epitaph, and he's like, "I want to sign you guys. You're great." I'm like, wow. Oh, okay. We weren't even trying to get. We never made a demo. Didn't do any of that stuff. So that's amazing. Just pure, pure luck that he was there, and you know, whatever. It was great. That's really cool. And so he put the first record out. Um, was that a self-titled record? Yep, yep, self-titled, yeah. yeah. And how was, was that good. received? That, that people were loving it? Oh, people really liked that. I think a lot of people viewed that as like sort of, you know, almost the successor to Dead Nasty, that mm. album in some ways. Yeah. Um, so that got a lot of really good reviews and everything. Um, and then, um, and just good reactions live and everything. Yeah. We did, again, we were kind of growing past where we thought we were because I had never intended it to be a full-time band and neither did, any of the other guys and so we yeah. got to the point after we put out the second record where i was like oh now we're really you know it's starting to become a thing and everybody was on different wavelengths and schedules and life cycles and everything yeah so then it ended up i kind of reformed the band a um, couple of tr you know transition lineups and then um the then we recorded um a punk rock academy fight song yeah and that was kind of where we kind of blew up and had 1994 our, you know yeah, was that in '94? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Right. Yeah, that and that was our big. Uh, that was as punk was exploding, you know, for a lot of bands. Like people yes, were discovering it, it all over, and so we we did that album. I was like, whoa, you know, all of a sudden we're like, wait, there's a thousand people here. Wait, what? You know, <laughs> like you know, or oh, whatever. Shit. You know, we're playing festivals, you know, yeah. and stuff. And so that was that was great. You know, there's still hard times, and we were still struggling a lot, but there were also great times. Did so, that, is that is that when you feel like you may, you might be doing music for a career at that point or no? Cause it seems like you always went back no, to school and yeah, I was always like one foot in both camps, you know, I like um, that though. But, Smart. Um, yeah. And well, it's just out of, out of love of both. Right. Like mm -hmm. I didn't want to not be in school cause I liked school and then I didn't want to not do music. Cause of course that's my, you know, my, my spirit, you know? Yeah. So, so it was just like uh, I tried to kind of walk that thin line. But after a while, down by law, I, I took a break from school again because it was getting, you know, I was a full time, you know, That's band amazing. Where doing the whole nonstop touring thing um, and uh, playing on the warp tours and all that stuff. So yeah. It was great. Like, you guys put a lot of records yeah. out too. I saw that all scratched up. Was it the next one, right? That was 1996. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All scratched up was next. And that also did, did you know, really well. And, um, um, you know, really well being, you know, punk, you know, yeah. term. It was you know, a great time to be an epitaph. Term, you know? Yeah. Like great. it didn't sell as many as the Rolling Stones, so, yeah. you know, but it, for a punk band, it was selling a lot and, and like not even, not even the sales as much as just like the, you know, the, the we're connecting with people and yeah. a lot of people love the words or the music or whatever. So that was really cool. Like, and by that time we were seeing so many, and I know you, I've seen personally a lot of H2O tattoos and, and I mean, there were a lot of DBL arrows so out cool, there. Man. Um, people getting those, air, those tattoos on hands, necks, yeah. you know, uh, calves, everything. It's so, amazing, man. And that was great. a great time to be on Epitaph and being the punk band, a hardcore band, whatever, like, that was prime time and it was such a, it was a magical time for just every single band I think um had some of the success from the really bigger bands trickle down to them because people always get mad about like punk sold out and the year punk broke and Brett caught a lot of shit for it. we talked about it on the podcast before but it's like offspring and all those bands that, that blew up it only helped out us younger bands it trickled down to us you know what I mean especially being an epitaph or just being on the warp tour just being around like people you know, they gave notice to what you were doing as well. It wasn't just the ones on TV and the radio. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And and I'm not sure where it was in the punk rock rule book that you couldn't be successful. I know, you know? I hate like, that, man. Right? Like, why do, why wouldn't you want your favorite band to be able to, like, you know, put a roof over their heads and have I a meal know. in there? in their you know, on the table, um, you know, from being like, you know, I don't begrudge 
the band who's successful at all Me their either. success. I mean, I want them to do well. And, uh, you it's know, so it strange. takes a lot of effort and sacrifice to be in a band. Yep. And, you know, and particularly in a punk band, right? It's not like we're like Led Zeppelin in 78 or whatever, you know, and mm-hmm. like, you know, big dressing rooms and, and, you know, you know, drinking champagne from the bottle or whatever i mean punk bands hardcore bands you know we 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 suffered i mean honestly totally. i'm not complaining I, I would i'll do it again in a, in a new york minute but like you know that it was not easy living you know and, and i mean in all when we were on tour man i was on people's couches every night yep. and and all of us were and um yep. you know and and you know, whatever, you know, sometimes we were hungry and, you know, whatever. And I'm not moaning or complaining because yeah. that's not the whole point. But the point is just to say, so when a band does succeed, like the Descendants right now are, yeah. are the biggest they've ever been. Totally. I'm so happy for them. Me too. So happy, man. Like they're, they deserve that. They, you know, there's a line in an early Descendants record that says, couldn't sell out a telephone booth. What I'm telling you is the truth. Yep. And man, that's true. They, they played the empty houses. It's hard to believe because now they're playing to huge places, but good for them man they stuck it out they kept at it they they did great record after great record Dude. after great record and you know it's, it's just awesome it's really good yeah, you know? i talked to milo on here too and he was telling me like how those first couple records how they received back then but when i think about those records the impact they had and how important they are to people now like 30 years later like it, it I don't know. Back then, you think, "Damn, you guys big! You guys sell our records!" Like it's because to me, you was so big in my eyes because I looked up to you and loved. I loved those records so much. But you know, they were like you said, going around like a bummy ass van. There was like twenty people at their shows. They didn't tour. The the tours were really really rough and sleeping on people's couches. And it wasn't all that. And then when they disappeared and come back with everything sucks, which I think is a fucking masterpiece from start to finish. And just come out, like, right? Uh, it's it's, and when I when I was telling him, I was like, that's like the biggest punk rock record comebacks ever. Not in, and he's like, well, not in, not in record sales, but as far as impact, the timing, how perfect this was, was the lyrics, everything. It's incredible that they, they came back and were able to do that. It's 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 magical actually. And then, like you said, where descendants are now, it's it's way well deserved. You know what I mean? Like, it's so fucking. They paid paid so much dues back then. You know, nobody cared. Totally. Totally. It's yeah. I, I, I love every word of that. Yep. Yep. Completely agree. It's crazy. And, uh, it's funny. So for, for these, for my solo show, the next night after I do this all reunion show and in, 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 on the 23rd and then I play on the 24th in Denver and the guys who are playing with me are in this, this really good, uh, uh, pop punk band, I guess for lack of a better term, but they're called bad year and they're good friends or, you know, Jack fantastic, uh, is, is our, is the drummer for that band. And he's also the drummer for, um, for down by law. Oh, awesome. But anyways, uh, Jack wrote me a, a thing and Jack loves the descendants, you know, like any true music fan and musician does. But he wrote me a thing because I, you know, like I said, we're going to do like four or five all songs, you know, for, for, so uh, cool. you know, and being, keeping in mind that all is the descendants except for, yeah. you know, Milo. And so he wrote me a thing, a text just the other night. He said, I hate all, of course he loves all. He said, I hate all. They are ridiculous musicians. Grr. Like he's, cause he's trying to play Bill Stevenson's parts, right? Like yeah. that ain't easy, you know? And, uh, you know, try and do, try and do, uh, Carl Alvarez bass lines. That's no picnic. Yeah, they're and incredible to players, Edgerton. man. Yeah. All of them, all three are, are ridiculous. So, um, you know, and again, I'm just, uh, like you say, I mean, they, they've earned every bit of, uh, both musically, you know, they, they put out just as good stuff now as their early stuff, which is yeah. a tough thing to do. And I, and I, I know Ramones had melody and they were more like a, I feel like their, their melodies are more from fifties doo-wop vibes. And, and I don't like using the word pop punk or like just the genre names, but I know, I know there are, genres called pop punk but i feel like descendants was like the first pop punk like uh playing fast hardcore music with melodies and singing songs about love and just all i don't know i could be wrong but i just i really feel like they were the first ones with that that melody you know what i mean like yeah i mean i think that they so there's a band in england or actually out of ireland excuse me to the undertones okay and, and i think they did it in in ireland and the descendants were that equivalent in- got you in in california and america like okay. they're both both of these bands so i'm not taking anything away from what you just said i'm actually yeah. adding to it that because to say a band's equivalent to me and with the undertones is an impact that that's a pretty bold statement but i would say it you know 
um, the descendants were doing something that nobody else was doing. And um, just, but if you haven't heard the undertones for anybody listening, I would definitely say check out the first two uh, undertones records, and they were phenomenal, just crazy good. I'm learning so much from people and like their influence, so I'll definitely put that in my notes. Um, I was going to tell and you, the Buzzcocks too, was of course, the, other band, the best. The kind of, yeah. And I bet you all the Buzzcocks are fans of the Descendants who are all fans of the Undertones who are all fans of the Buzzcocks. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I bet you those three bands are all like totally uh, fans of each other because they all were like kind of like brilliant songwriters mixed with angst, mixed with love. Yeah, Buzzcocks were when it wasn't cool. Because even when you look man. at the Sex Pistols and stuff and they were they were like you know, talking about anarchy and all that stuff, which is great, right? Like that's, oh, yeah. you know, oh, it's not great for me, for my philosophy, but it's, it's a cool thing from a rock band and everything. Yeah. But, but like all of a sudden you get the buzzcocks, you know, singing, I just want to love her like any yes. other, what do I get, you know, or, or you get the undertone saying, you know, here comes the summer and you get the descendant saying, when I get the time, Oof. you know, and, and, you know, these are like human emotions that you can connect with. So you might rock out yes. to the, to the pistol saying anarchy in the UK, but you're going to like, your heart is going to connect with, you know, the songs that kind of are about the shared human condition. Yeah. I know? didn't know nothing. I didn't know what a bollock was. I was too young. Like, never mind the bollocks. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what the UK was. Right. I didn't know right. That yeah. Shit. That's very English. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Um, that's funny. I got a Peter, I got a Pete Shelley story for you. I don't think I ever told on the podcast, but I told somebody recently is that, um, when I was living in New York, we, we got a phone call on a home phone. My, my, my wife's like, Oh, it's, um, somebody's on the phone. She's like, Oh, I think it's Barney from Napalm Death. Cause he was my only friend I had at the time from England. I knew no, nobody from England. And we had toured with Napalm Death in the early nineties when I was a roadie for sick of it all. Anyway, awesome. this guy awesome. gets on the phone. He's like, Hey, this is Peter Shelley. Um, from the Buzzcocks, I want, I'm, I'm going to talk to Toby. And this is me. He's like, "Hey, mate, this is Peter Shell." I go, "No, it's not." And he's like, "What do you mean, mate? Whatever." I was like, "This is Barney from Napalm Death." He's like, "Who? What?" I go, "Napalm Death." He goes, "Oh, mate, that band's from so and so, South England." Like you knew exactly where they're from. He's like, "That's not. I'm not him. I'm Peter Shelley. I got your phone number from so and so. I'm looking. I want to take your band H2O on tour." And I was like. I just I couldn't believe it the whole time. I just didn't believe he was actually calling. I said, "Talk to you my know wife." You're being pranked, yeah. right? You're so being, you're, this is on. This is gonna be on camera, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, and so yeah, I, I put my wife on the so phone with him, and she came back. She goes, "I really think it's him." So I get on the phone with him, and it's actually him. And somehow he got my number. Somehow he heard my band. Some. It was totally surreal moment, and unfortunately, we couldn't do the tour. We were going somewhere the following week, but ended up realizing it was him at the end of the phone call and thanking him and. Tell him much I love his band, but it was a really random phone call. I, I got to figure out who who made that contact, but I didn't. I that didn't, is I, a great story. <laughs> That's crazy. That is a great story. Well, he was a sweet guy. We did one tour with him in Down by Law. Oh, and, nice. Um, and uh, we we you know we did a bunch of shows, like a month worth of shows, and um, and uh, he was a sweet guy, and and um, they were great. And Steve Diggle was a total rock star, you know, and. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was it was just great, but I still remember, and I actually wrote this on my Facebook page uh, after he died, um, after Pete Shelley died, and I said my favorite memory of that tour was coming in and and we were we were working on some songs together in the dressing room, and you know mostly he was working on it, and I was kind of listening, and we were kind of talking about different you know lyric ideas and yeah. vocal melodies, and you know, and meanwhile you know like you with you know some of your heroes or yep. me with some of mine i'm like oh i'm sitting here talking about music with pete shelley what the yeah you know, what's so the awesome and and um but so we wrote this one and he wrote it you know and and then and then it was get, getting kind of sort of close to time to leave this is after the show yeah and and i said well you know hey pete don't you need to like you know hum uh, track that somehow you know put it on the phone or whatever and he said he had a great line he said well dave if I can't remember it tomorrow, it must not have been a very good song then, right? Mm. And I was like, whoa, dude, that just <laughs> kind of blew my mind. You That's know? a great point. So, and he was right, right? If you can't remember that the next day, then how good was it? I, so I agree. I, I just loved that, um, you know. And it, it, uh, it was so it sad was when he passed, very, man. That was super sad, man. Super sad, way too young. Yeah, you know, that, all that stuff. Uh, but just goes to show you cherish every day because you don't know, you know, how long you you get, and you don't get it to you don't get to pick it. So, um, yeah, so cherish it. Yeah. Um, okay, back to uh, down below real quick. So I'm looking at all the album titles. I don't have to go through all of every single record you did, but you did a lot of records, man. It's crazy, man. Um, 
Last of the Sharpshooters, Fly the Flag, um, The Wind and, and the Tides, and The Wayward Sails, right? Did I say that right? Yeah, Windward Tides and Wayward Sails. That's kind of a funny thing. Actually, interestingly, I mean? yeah. just yesterday, uh, Sam uh, sent me a note. Sam is, is my longtime partner and musical genius in Down nice. by Law, and he's the best guitar player you know he tied for best guitar player in the u.s uh, oh, wow. in the world maybe he's he's phenomenal people who don't know sam williams um you gotta check out some down by lost stuff but especially if you see us live now okay. it's just phenomenal to watch him but but anyways uh he, he sent me a note yesterday saying yeah there's a label that wants to repress windward tides and wayward sales because oh, i guess it's, you know we sold out of the initial run and then there were never any more printed or whatever and so Oh wow! Said, yeah, sure. That sounds great. That's you know? awesome. And, um, yeah, so, so we're gonna make new vinyl of Windward Tides and Wayward Sales, and that album was named. We had a um, a song list up in the studio, and um, you know, people would just write ideas, which is how we named Punk Rock Academy Fight Song as well. Gotcha. And I wrote that title down, and then Hunter, our drummer at that time, came out and said, "Who named the album?" And then everybody was like, "What?" <laughs> and he said. Yeah, Punk Rock Academy fight song. Who did that? And I said, Oh, I did. You know, I wrote it as a joke because it's all one word, like no, yeah. no breaks or anything. And so that's the album title. And I was like, Oh, like he wasn't. There was no changing it after that because Hunter had just said, you know. So, so, but with when we're tied to Wayward Tales, our our roadie, um, who's you know a very chaotic um, guy who you know has tons of. Um, activities that i don't indulge in yep. um but uh but he wrote that down and um and that was my moment to look at it and say oh there's the album title you know jimbo you wrote that and he said yeah i did you know like, <laughs> he just, you know and uh, said, wow you know that's crazy and um so so yeah we uh we got that title from just a list on the wall. That's how we named a couple of my albums in my life. Yeah, because you get those like those those rough those rough tracks or the demos we have that too. Like there's a piece of cardboard on the wall in the studio. People listening right now, and you write down like just names. Some of the names are based off of like what the song's styled after, what it's inspired by. You could have a song like one of our songs. What happened was called Egg Hunt because had an like, Egg Hunt vibe to it, and we didn't know what it was gonna end up right. sounding like. So it was just the Egg Hunt on the wall, like. Uh, but, but yeah, you get these, nice. like, yeah, you get these ideas of songs, and you put them on this piece of paper, and then, like you said, sometimes they stick, sometimes they don't. That became your album title. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> so it's cool. Yeah, yeah, and and you gotta you gotta like take a uh, a chill pill on it because the next day it might not be as funny. The funny ones are the ones you have to watch out for because what seemed funny on a you know Friday night in a studio might not sound so good on Monday morning. You know, it might not be as funny. So you gotta. That's true. You gotta, like be wary of humor humor can come back to bite you so so all these albums i'm looking at like um champion at heart revolution time all in which is the latest one the last one you guys did um was this was this a full-time gig for you at, at this at all these albums were you doing stuff in between or just full-time touring no there were long breaks actually okay. um we were a full-time band from like the early nineties through the, you know, through that 97, 98 period when I moved back to, uh, back to Virginia. Yeah. But, um, but then we, we, you know, kind of just took long breaks and we ended up, you know, leaving Epitaph, which was, you know, kind of sad and traumatic. We and, did that. Um, so we did the same thing. Then, yep. Did you? Oh yeah. Well, I hope yours wasn't as traumatic and sad, but it is sad anytime you do that. Even totally. You do it on the best of circumstances. Cause it's sort of like, you know, you, you're part of a family, and that's you another are. thing that's different about punk rock. Like, it's not like you're the Rolling Stones on Capitol or whatever, you know, totally. and, and you're, it's more of a business arrangement or whatever. Yeah. You're, and I'm sure they have fondness for each other. I'm sure that the Rolling Stones liked some of their executives on their record label and everything. But but still, it's not the same as a punk rock label. No, not at all. And um, so. And Brett's family, uh, yeah, Brett was but, always great to us there, man. Good, I'm sure good. I'm glad yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so anyway, so we did that and then we kind of just made albums here and there when we could. And I honestly, and this isn't like willful thinking or wishful thinking. I mean, like when I heard All In, which is our most recent album, yep. um, I was like, oh, wow, this is really good. Like the, the Sam killed it on the songwriting. And, um, you know, there's some really, really good songs on there. And I put on horns on one of the songs. Awesome. And, um, just, yeah, yeah, it's so, so good. So I would say, you know, Down By Law is my longest band, but it hasn't been, um, you know, hasn't been consistently since yeah. 1991 or whatever. It's been, yeah. been on and off. 
but never broke up. Never broke up officially like a yeah. breakup. No. Yeah. No. Why would I? I mean, I'm in a band with Sam Williams. who's amazing, and we have fun, and we write. You know, uh, I will argue, at least from my perspective, we are, we write great songs together. So, um, you know, I'm writing some of the best lyrics with with him, and it's just it's it's a great vibe. You know, so uh, kind of like you. I mean, you've had a pretty consistent you know group around you. I know that sometimes when yeah. you tour, you have some some different you know guitar things player. That are going on with people. Can't, yeah. yeah. But but overall, I mean, you know, if you're in a, if you got a, you know, winning hand, don't throw it away. You know, keep uh, I agree, it. man. I'm very lucky because it's all original members except for my brother, who plays in the Offspring, but he goes back and forth to us when he can. But um, nice. But he stays. Nice. He stays. Great. He stays pretty busy. Um, what what year did you become a dad? Say again, sorry. What year? What year did you become a father? Oh, a uh, dad. Um, let's see. So. Um, Madeline was born in '95. Oh, nice! So '95, yeah, yeah. That's and awesome. My next daughter um, was born on, in a year, a year plus later in '96. So, yeah, yeah, it's great. And you're a dad, right? I yeah, think. it changes yeah. a lot when you become a dad. Like your perspective on the world, and then also like trying to balance, like you know, following your dreams and being a musician and traveling and touring, and then you know, balancing the real life at home too. You know. Right, right. And and it's one of the things I've learned is so the joyous moments of childhood are, are precious and, um, you know, parenthood with a child, I mean, and then then they grow up and darn if they don't become their own people and do things that you don't always like or agree with or, <laughs> you know true. what I mean? It's like, yeah. you know, and I still remember, you know, like in late high school and, and parts of college, you know, I went through periods where I didn't talk to my mom or dad or whatever. And Me I too. regret those times now. Me but too. um but that's I guess part of the growing process and so I've now I'm on the other end of like, you know, they'll say or do something that I don't maybe agree with. But mostly they're I mean they're phenomenal kids, you know, I'm very blessed. But, you know, doesn't mean that they're gonna be who you think they are when they're five years old and holding know, your hand, man, you know. I know it's, man. I it's had this interesting Go ahead. They, they have the nerve to grow up and become independent. How dare yeah. them! <laughs> I right, yeah. <laughs> but it's like it, it, yeah. I have like I have this whole anxiety of you know my son's sixteen. He's gonna be like leaving the leaving the leaving the nest in a couple of years. You know what I mean? Like sooner than later, it goes by fast. It's just the whole like it, he's been a part of my, my life for like whatever sixteen. <laughs> well, he's just my. I just when when the fact that they can just leave the nest and just. I never want to lose that connection that we have. It they, they really stresses me out, like the whole not going to be here for everything, you know, living with you and stuff. It's, it's I know, man, it is. But you know what? It's just like view it as a chapter in your book, right? Yeah. And, and you've you've done a great job in your in your book, and now there's going to be a new a new chapter, right? Like it's like in Lord of the Rings, you know, like <laughs> Fellowship of the Ring is great, but then then you finish that book and you go on to Two Towers, but you're still within the same. You know the same theory, the same world, the same you know Middle Earth and all this stuff. But you're you're in a new book and new yeah. chapter, and then you and you know and then you go to Return of the King, and that's a whole new thing too. So no, that's true. You know, I don't know if that's the best analogy, but definitely it's the chapter good. thing. I do view I do view the chapter thing as like my view of how I you know like you know my my uh, what their mother the, the girl's mother when when they would do new things at a different point, you know, five or seven or nine, yeah. whatever age. And she'd kind of get this, this thing like, Oh, you know, it's kind of sad because she, you know, was missing the, the, the sweetness of it. And I would too, but I would also mm. say, oh, this is great. They're doing just what they're supposed to do. They're, you know, they're growing and they're enjoying and they're, you know, that's, that's part of their chapter. They're turning chapters too. How, how old are they now? Uh, my oldest daughter is 23. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so so she's out the house. She's gone. Oh yeah, no, she actually right now lives in uh, England. Um, oh my she's, god, she's working, working, and getting her master's degree in England. Yeah, that's so. amazing, man. Yeah, it's crazy. It's cool. So thankfully, yeah, thankfully, we got great. FaceTime now, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, she's she's uh, she's actually hard to reach, unfortunately, because uh, the time like, zone. Yeah, the time zone, and then you know she's. She's working and going to college and has a boyfriend. So, you know, altogether, dad is like fourth or fifth on that list, right? So, <laughs> you know, so that's that's all right. You just gotta, you gotta, like, you know, uh, you just gotta just say, hey, hope you're doing well. Love you, you know, and it'll come around. 
I, I, lo- I love how you balance like your all your music career with with like education and actually and having like a plan B and always had your foot in there. I, it's it's amazing. Not many people do that and can actually do both. It's pretty amazing you yeah, did it's, that. You it's know definitely I mean? hard, you know. It, yeah. it definitely takes a lot of, uh, you know, focus to do it. But um, again, like with doing music or whatever you do in life, whether you're, you know, an accountant or, you know, own a business or whatever you do, a tattoo, it doesn't matter. Like, just love what you do. And if you love yes. what you do, that makes everything else a lot better. I, I agree. So, even th- now, loving what you do doesn't mean there won't be moments of frustration and, of course. and pain and, and, and even worry or angst, you know. Mm-hmm. But, you know, um, as much as I've, you know, bled and, you know, scuffled and everything else, yeah. um, I wouldn't trade it, you know. Totally. So. Do, do you have any regrets in your life? Regrets? That's a good question. I think if I had one regret... You know, so I think that, um, you know, getting a divorce was pretty hardcore. Mm. That was pretty bad. Um, so that, that is not something I would wish on, on anybody. anybody. Um, and I think that I regret that it that probably, sucks. you know, was tough on the kids. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's really a regret. Were they younger? Um, no, happens? they weren't. Okay. And I think that was a good thing and a bad thing. The yeah. good thing was that, that, you know, they, they were not younger, but the bad thing was they're old enough to like, you know, really feel it. Whereas, you know, you see some, I have friends who, who come together as both divorced parents with kids yeah. and those families, bl- they blend together because the kids are like five years old and totally. so there's no, like, there's no chance for, you know, any sort of, you know, angst that comes with them. They're just like, yeah. okay, this is the new reality. Like younger yeah. kids are more, um, easy to, to bond with, you know, a new situation. So, so that, that might be regret, uh, but you know, then again, the, the flip side you always come back to in that situation or like quitting a band really is like, yep. yeah, but if I'd stayed, it was so angst ridden and so painful, would that have, you know, would, would that have done anybody any good either? Yeah. You know? So, or and maybe even hurt those around you as well. So there's sense. always that flip side where you never know, uh, you know, what you do in life is good, but you can't regret. So I guess the answer is no, mm-hmm. because you have to say, this is the road I'm on and this is the road that I was meant to be on. I'm doing the best I can to be a good person and to make the world better through music. And, yeah. and, and you know, like that's, you know, and are there bumps in that road of life? Hell yeah, there are. Um, totally. But that's, that's the other thing about bumpy roads is if you've ever been on a bumpy road, which all of us have been either you know, metaf- metaphysically or actual bumpy roads, the road always smooths out after a while. Yeah, it does. Like that's the thing, and and then you, then you're you're cruising at sixty five, uh, you know, listening to your favorite song, and life is great. So, yeah. you know, so there are bumps in the road of life, and it sucks when it's happening. Um, but uh, you get through it, and then you enjoy the good times, and the good times outweigh the bad. Hopefully, I agree. And um, what do you think? Um... What do you think keeps you going and inspired to keep creating music? It seems like you've been nonstop since like you were a teenager. Yeah, I know. I, I'm a, first of all, I'll tell you this: luck. Okay. You know, Toby, you know this too. Like, if you're in the right place at the right time, the right scene, and the right label, mm-hmm. and all that stuff, that's that's luck. Yeah. To some degree, you got to be lucky in life, and and I think I've been very blessed to be lucky. Um, and then. You know, surrounding yourself with the right people, you know, like I said, yeah. Sam Williams, come on, man. I mean, you know, uh, yeah, John Anastas, you know, was like the perfect teammate for me and still lifelong friend. Jonathan is, is an amazing friend of mine. Very, yeah. Very close. And, um, you know, whatever the, you know, pick your person that you've been with that influenced you, that you play with or that, yeah. you know, your, your wife, whoever, you know, who encourages you, whoever it is, like, or multiple people, surrounding yourself with the right people is also really important and then I agree. Um, making stuff that you love and right now I'm so lucky I'm like I'm in Down by Law I'm in the Bandoleros who are just phenomenal players from Spain I to check that and out they're, they're, oh my gosh dude I'll try and you know after we're done just send me an, an address and I'll try okay, and get cool. one sent out to you um, it's called uh, Join the Outsiders. It's one of my favorite records I'm in my 50s I just made one of my favorite records of my career that's and, awesome and they're 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 so it's a joyful album it's a joyful album and they are to like that in person like we have so much fun when we do shows together and i mean it's it's really a great it's a great record and um and then uh and then i'm in don't sleep and we're putting out this record 
you know, we're signed to victory, but victory just got bought. So I'm not Saw sure, that. you know, how that all, all is going to turn up at the records so far, knock on wood, you know, it's amazing what we've been tracking. So, so, so I think next year, 2020, I could conceivably have a new album from down by law, a new album from the Bandoleros and, and a new, um, and a new album from don't sleep. That's and amazing. I think all of them have, have something creative and good and vibrant and compelling and, um, you just got to ride the wave, right? Like, yeah. like if I have three bands that are, that are doing great stuff and I won't say I'm doing great because I don't want to put that, but I'll say they're great. The musicians <laughs> that I'm playing with and they're doing great stuff. So if they're doing great stuff and I got a chance to play with three great bands, hell yeah, I'm going to ride that wave till it goes to the shore, you yeah, know? Yeah, for sure. And then, uh, and then, you know, and eventually all those waves do eventually, you know, go to the shore, but you just, you enjoy the hell out of riding that surfboard. You know, you, yeah. you ride that to you're in the curl and you, you get that exhilaration and you make that world a better place and you make people smile and rock out. Like what, what could be better? No, I, I, I love know? that. We're very lucky to be able to do that and still be able to make music and create. Oh my and... gosh. And you know, I mean, you know, when I, you know, honestly, you know, like I'll tell people we did this interview and they'll be like, Oh, I love them. You know, I love him. And, you know, and, <laughs> and how great is that? You, you've, you've like influenced like so many people. That's huge. That's so huge. Yeah. And your PMA brother comes through, man. I mean, Thank your you, PMA comes through, it comes through on your, in your, in your albums and it comes through right now and it comes through on stage. So, um, you know, you're, you're living proof of what we all started and, 1981 getting in fights with jocks and Kenmore Square, man. That's crazy. You know, so. <laughs> That's crazy. I was going to ask you if you're optimistic or pessimistic, but uh, you got the PMA too as well. And I think that's why, Thanks, brother. I think that's why you still love what you do. And it's, that's why you still do it. And you've always been uh, focused, you know what I mean? Through everything you've been through and all the different bands. Yeah, I'm trying, and, you know, and, and again, uh, for anybody listening who's going through tough times, there's no getting around it. It's not like you want to tell somebody in a tough time, Oh, you know, you know, don't, don't feel so bad. No, it's going to suck when you're in a bad period, whatever mm -hmm. that is, relationships or, or job problems or money problems or, yeah, of course. or, you know, health problems. I mean, God, I look at so many people have, you know, so many health problems. And so life can be really just, you know, overwhelming sometimes. But the other thing is, man, you are blessed to live in this day and age when like like getting back to that edward the third book you know somebody got a scratch on their arm they die or whatever you know yeah. like i mean you know we we live in an era when you know medical and and our economy is doing great and and whatever like like these are things that are so fortunate and you know like you know people got freaking you know people had leeches put on them to get better when yeah. you know in 1700s or whatever you know like True. that's crazy to think about i'm going to bleed you because i want you to feel better you're going to we're going to bleed <laughs> you as crazy. part of your regular health like what that's insane right like but they would do it and um so just be glad of like that we're in this era and this time and enjoy the hell out of it and let let rock be your guide i mean yeah. ultimately if you if you live a life where rock is your guide and your and your kind of best friend i think that's a a, a good way to live yeah do you have any, you have any daily like daily rituals you do like things you do every, do you have any daily rituals that you do every day something you do every day it's like a daily ritual any, you? any i'm sorry i'm not understanding I uh, uh, you have any daily daily rituals you do every day daily. oh rituals i'm sorry yeah, yeah yeah sorry um so rituals um no in fact i gotta get off now because i gotta go in and see my uh my little my little adorable four-year-old um that's a ritual but oh, four -year -old, um, awesome. no, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I uh, I'm gonna go play with, uh, with her in, uh, in the dollhouse. I, like literally, I'm gonna come in. This is a guarantee. I'll put a steak dinner on it. Like, come in, <laughs> daddy, and she'll run up and grab my leg, and I say, dollhouse. All right, then we go, <laughs> go downstairs and go to the dollhouse. Like that's a, that's a, that's a sure bet right there. So, um, father, so that's being a ritual, father's but, the best. Yeah, being a father's the best. It's it is. Yep, yep, and um. So yeah, no, I mean, not really any rituals. Like, like I know some people are, are into yoga or into yeah. you know, certainly people are into, um, you know, Krishna have certain rituals that they do. Um, we got to play a few shows with shelter and don't sleep. And that was awesome. Awesome to hang out with those guys. Yeah. Uh, by the way, by the way, we got to do a don't sleep H2O. Like we got to do it. Um, are, we, um, are we guys based on all the East coast? Oh really? No, you know, cool. no, I know. Are you are you guys based on the East Coast? Are you guys? Oh, we don't have any right now because the album 
thing. So we're okay. waiting until the album comes out, but it'll be out like I think in spring ish. Um, yeah, we, we'll so, keep, yeah, we'll we'll make it happen for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think we would be the perfect, uh, uh, you know, compliment to you guys, and we get the audience nice and lathered for you. I would love then, that. Uh, and then we'll and then we'll go kick back. I'll I'll have a nice bottle of you know uh, water in my hand. And I'll get to be relaxed while you're working your butt off there and uh, having fun. So yeah, we should do it for sure. Well, th- well, thank thank you so much for your time. I know you got to go. I want to thank you for everything you put out in this world that inspired me as a kid and still inspires me. Um, like I say, that can I say is uh, I have the tattoo. You know that I have like that was a big impact yeah, man, on my that means life. So much to me. Thank you, thank you, brother. And um, I appreciate yeah. you still making music and still out here, man, and living yeah, the dream man. and making well, people smile. You know. Thanks, man. I'm gonna keep trying, and I uh, hope everybody out there keeps trying, and and look forward to seeing. You know, the quote Frank Sinatra: "The best is yet to come." Right. So yes. let's, <laughs> let's go for it. All right, Dave. Thank you so much, man. All right, brother. You I'll got speak, it. Thanks for having me. Soon. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening. Um, please rate, review, uh, subscribe. If you haven't subscribed yet to this podcast, please do that. And whatever platform you are listening to this on, I'm glad you found me. You can rate me and review me on there also. So thank you guys sincerely for the support. I cannot wait for you guys to hear the next one.